Sing a place to hide this weary soul This backbone and I try with all my might I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A backbone Just when I
storm that surrounds me yeah. Just one word Darkness has to retreat Just one touch And I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one time. Oh, no. 
promised Messiah. Angels, let your song begin. Dear heaven, Christ is born in Bethlehem. The concept of mercy is one that sometimes is hard for us to grasp as humanity. It wouldn't be much of a stretch to say we, as a whole, struggle with being merciful. In the city of Jerusalem was a place called the Pool of Bethsaida. Now this pool and other pools like it were called mitkvah baths. It's a place where Hebrew people would come and bathe to purify themselves as an ancient ritual custom. The Aramaic language translates Bethsaida to mercy. And it makes sense that the Pool of Bethsaida was known as the House of Mercy when you consider the people who gathered there. You see, in this time, disabilities of any sort were regarded as a consequence of sin. And a pool of purification was a place where people thought they could rid themselves of all these ailments. They believed that 
periodically, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir the pool. And whoever the first person into the water would be completely healed. And that's where we join this story. Jesus makes a trip to the pool of Bethsaida. And he sees a man laying at the edge of the water. This is a man who's been completely paralyzed for 38 years. He's been unable to move and able to care for himself for most of his life. Jesus approaches this man and he asks him one simple, powerful, and merciful question. Do you want to get well? The man, I imagine, he breaks down before Jesus and he tells him his entire life story. And he says that, that he's been trying for years to make it into the pool, but he, he's had no one to help him. And, and even if he were to make it into the water, someone else has always beaten him there. Someone's always beaten him into the water, and he is yet to be the one to be healed. And so Jesus says to the man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And he does. The scriptures say that he gets up and he walks away. But I think that John might have been downplaying a bit if I could be so bold to say that. I imagine the man took off running. After 38 years of not, of not being able to walk, of being immobile, of being in pain, there's no way that this man didn't go running or skipping or perhaps even dancing out of that pool. And on his way out, the man runs into the Pharisees who, because of ancient Jewish laws, ask him to put down his mat. And I know that seems silly, but it is the Sabbath day after all, and, and there's a lot of limitations on what someone could or could not do on the Sabbath. And so they see this man and they ask him, why is he carrying this mat? And I'm sure that man wanted to say, because I can. For the first time in my life, I can. But he says, the man who healed me told me to pick it up. You see, what has happened here is there's been a change in authority. This man recognizes that Jesus has done more for him than the law ever has. Hey, New Point, I want to welcome each and every one of you, uh, whether you're joining us online or whether you're at one of our six locations, we're excited about what God is doing and what he wants to do in you and through you. Now, one of the things I want to encourage you to do if you haven't done this or maybe you're not aware of it, and that is the daily. The daily is a simple daily devotional that we provide on our app or website, and it complements the weekly messages. And I just want to encourage you to take advantage of it as we continue to teach week in and week out. We want to be able to help you to really grow in your relationship with Jesus. Why? Because he makes life better and he makes you and I better at life. So take advantage of those if you have not been doing so. I promise you it will enrich uh, your relationship with him. Now, we're walking through the Gospel of John and his writings. And John is, is writing about specific events that Jesus did. And what we have to understand is John did not choose to follow Jesus because of faith. He followed Jesus because of what he saw and what he heard. And what he saw and what he heard, he came to the conclusion that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he placed his trust, he placed his faith in Jesus as being his Messiah, his Savior. And so he didn't follow Jesus because of faith. He followed because of what he saw and because of what he heard. And he writes about this. Matter of fact, in one of his letters, 1 John, here's what he writes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have what? Touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Wow. He goes on to say it in this way. The life appeared, and we have seen it, and we testify to it. That's why he's writing. He goes on to say, we proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard. And so John doesn't write this so that we will just know what happened. He says, I want you to know why it happened. I want you to do something about what has happened. 
And so he writes these words at the end of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the theme. That's the key. The Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life. Zo, zo, living life and life to the fullest in his name. And so John is saying, though you haven't seen him, I'm writing so that you will put your faith in him because I have. I've seen him. I heard him. I literally rubbed shoulders with him. I touched him. And so that you might what? That you might believe. He's not asking us to believe in belief, but to believe in what he saw, what he heard, what he experienced. Now, the first two miracles were kind of behind the scenes. And uh, the one that we're going to look at today is the account of a miracle in Jerusalem, which means that it was in front of everyone. And it is because of this that Jesus will begin to share his ministry and his teaching in a new way by shaking everything that can be shaken. The Hebrew writer puts it like this. He will take away everything of this world that can be shaken so the things that cannot be shaken will be left. Wow. And here's what it means to shake everything. Maybe you've done this. You'll probably do this because spring is coming. You'll do spring cleaning, and you'll take that rug, and you'll take it outside, and you'll just beat it, right? And, and, and dust will fly, and, and things will come out of it, and it will release things, and then you'll shake it again, and then you'll bring it back up, and you'll do it all over again until you see no more dust or debris coming from it. And you'll say, okay, now it's ready. That's what the Hebrew writer was talking about here. He was saying, you know what? I'm going to shake everything out. I'm going to get it back to its original foundation or purpose of my intent. And in this story, we see Jesus perform a miracle that would shake everybody's thinking, everybody's way of thinking and doing life. And what we have to be aware of is make no mistake of this. Jesus came to dismantle our dysfunction, specifically their dysfunction, which can become our dysfunction. And because it took place in Jerusalem, there were entirely a diverse group of people and, and, and so what happens is this. You know, maybe you're a leader, or maybe you've played the game telephone, okay? You know, you say something, and then it goes to the next person, and then it goes to the next person, and it goes to the next person, and it goes to the next person. And the original message doesn't get through. Have you been there, leader? You know, you're talking, and you're wanting to drive your vision your idea, your strategy, all the way through the company or the organization, and you find out that somewhere you experience a hiccup and what you were saying and what you were conveying really didn't get there, the original intent. And so Jesus has come to clarify and to make sure that the original intent of God's heart is being heard is being experienced, is being embraced. And so John records this story. Let's look at it, John chapter five. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, this is the diverse group, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, laid on the porches. Now, here's what you have to understand, okay? There was a belief that this pool of water, every once in a while, uh, uh, an angelic being, an angel would come and would stir the pool. And in stirring the pool, whoever would get into it first could be healed. But if you read 
the background on this, what they ended up discovering was that there was a spring at the bottom of the pool and it would bubble up. And so because they had some kind of suspicion, they thought it was an angel, an angelic being. And, and, and so they, they thought, you know what, if I can just get into the pool and be the first one, I'll be healed. Can you imagine the chaos of trying to get into that pool? Of knowing that just every so often, you're going to have this opportunity? It was crazy. John continues, and he says, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, Jesus took notice of him and knew he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, now this is so critical, so important. Would you like to get well? Wow. For the first time, this man senses that somebody cares that somebody has noticed him, that somebody feels for him. And it begins with a conversation. And what I want us to know is that what we see here is Jesus is dismantling the dysfunction of carelessness. See, this man was an outcast by the Jewish leaders. And they thought that he was experiencing this sickness because he was being punished by God, because he was a wicked man. And no one of any importance would have spoken to him. And this man had no idea who Jesus was. And, and, and so Jesus is dismantling the dysfunction of carelessness because Jesus noticed him. Jesus spoke to him. And you and I can be careless, can we not? And there can be all kinds of people around us. And we can pass them by. And they're there for you and I to speak to them. To help them, to serve them. Because Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? And what we have to understand is this is not so much about the faith of the man as it is the compassion of Jesus. You see, you dismantled the dysfunction of carelessness because of a lack of compassion. When you are careless, when I am careless, we're not compassionate people. We have other things on our mind. And yet we learn of this man, he had lived for 38 years which probably meant that he accepted it as reality. This is just the way it's going to be. And this is a huge spiritual issue for all of us here today because what I want to say is we have a remedy. His name is Jesus Christ. And sometimes we've been living with a problem for so long that we think there is no remedy. Maybe you've had a marriage that has, has just been anything but healthy. And you just say, well, this is just the way it is. Or maybe you have an addiction. Or maybe your work, whatever. And you think, I've been living with this so long, there's no way that there's a remedy for it. And I want to tell you today that there is. His name is Jesus. And he has compassion towards you. He knows you. He wants to speak to you. And he wants to ask the question, do you want to be well? And so we see this in Jesus that he came to dismantle the dysfunction of carelessness. He wants you and I to be aware of the people around us that are hurting. But also he wants to dismantle the dysfunction of complacency. And this is where you and I have a, a part to play. You know, the man was at the pool of Bethesda. Why? Because so to speak, he wanted to get healed. Why would he be there if he didn't want to get healed? And yet Jesus asked him, would you like to be well? Why did Jesus ask him that? Let me tell you why. Because not everybody wants to get well. Not everybody wants to change. Even if they're at the pool of Bethesda. You see, listen, some people might be there because they want company. They're lonely. Some people might be there because they want sympathy. They want people to feel sorry for them. Some people might be there because they want charity. They want people who have big hearts to give them things. 
And here's what I want you to know. Not everybody wants to get well. Do you? You see, here's what I believe. Too many of us want to feel better. We don't want to get better. And it happens in the church. You would like to think that everybody who's here today, everybody who's listening to my voice, everybody who will hear this message, you would like to think that they're coming to get healed, to get well, to have their lives transformed. That's something that they're dealing with, a marriage, a relationship, their finances, life in general, that they could be transformed and be healed by the power of God. But let me ask you a question. How many do you think, okay, want that? How many do you think that everybody who's here today or listening today really wants their life changed? I want you to know I love you. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of people don't. They want sympathy. They want company. They want charity. And Jesus would ask you and I today, do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? Do you have the want to, to proceed to embrace the how to? Do you want to be well? You see, this man at the pool, Bethesda, never thought his situation or his life could be changed, but Jesus was there. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? Look at what he says, because he's dealing with his dysfunctional complacency. Jesus just asked him a yes or no question, and here's how he responds. I can't, sir, the the, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water bubbles up, someone else always gets there ahead of me. You know what he's saying? He's making excuses. Jesus just said, I ask you a question, yes or no, do you want to be well? And he goes into this victim of telling Jesus, no one helps me. There's no hope for me. Have some sympathy for me. So let me ask you today, what has happened to you? Are you in the mindset that you tell people what they did to you and how they did it and when they did it and why you're still broken? And really you find yourself in a place of complacency? Jesus would say, would you like to be healed? Do you want to change that? Some of us would say, no. You know why? Because it gives me something to complain about. It gives me an excuse. And it's easier to complain than it is to change. See, most of us, truth be known, we don't like to change. I'll settle for a miserable life rather than to know the uncertainty of the future I don't know. Because, see, what happens is if this man gets healed, he's going to experience a future that's uncertain that he's never known. And so Jesus asked this man, do you want to be healed? Look at what John continues. John John says this, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. And here's the rub of the story that John is telling. Okay, look what it says here. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They weren't excited that this man's life had been forever changed, okay? They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? They basically saying, you're not playing by my rules. And Jesus came to dismantle the dysfunction of callous religion. Callous religion, legalism, legalism. And Jesus was really getting at the core of saying, you know what, you value your rules and your traditions more than you do people. And Jesus is dismantling the dysfunction of callous religion, legalism. What is that? Let me give you a definition. Legalism, a strict adherence to the law without regard to its original intent. 
See, Jesus was reestablishing his original message. Somewhere it got cloudy. Somewhere it got foggy. Somewhere it got confusing. And legalism is following the rules, but paying no mind to why they were created in the first place. And here we have religious leaders during the time of Jesus. They didn't start off that way, but they drifted that way. And they began to identify themselves as rule keepers. Have you ever been around one? And in the process, they lost the treasure. And this is the whole point of this miracle. You see, Jesus could have done this miracle on the next day because the guy wasn't terminally ill. He wasn't in hospice. He had been this way for 38 years. But remember, okay, Jesus picked the Sabbath. And here's what I want us to understand here, okay? Jesus picked the Sabbath, and God had given the Sabbath as a time of rest, as a time of relaxation, enjoyment, and doing things. And the only thing that you were not able to do on the Sabbath was your normal work. And yet the Jewish leaders... They added dozens and dozens and dozens of restrictions and binding commands of behavior on the Sabbath. You know what that is? That is religion. And Jesus paid no attention to their legalistic man-made Sabbath regulation. A man had been healed. A man had been restored. And you're telling him he can't carry his sleeping mat because it's the Sabbath? You see, Jesus knew that the Sabbath was given to honor God, to glorify God. It was a gift to mankind, and it had got cloudy. It had got confusing, and people were using it to to condemn people and shame people. And Jesus goes right at the Jewish leaders, at the heart of their system of rules and regulations, and he does it by an act of compassion. You see, Jesus knew Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. He understood that, but they had twisted it. They had made it into something that they should never have made it in. Let let me help you with it, okay? Uh, we We don't have coffee in the sanctuary. Really, who made that rule? Was that Jesus? I don't think so. Uh, We don't run in the church. Is Was that Jesus? I don't think so. Those are man-made rules. And so what happens is we can come up with man-made rules that, that keep people at a distance from God. And Jesus was here to dismantle that dysfunction. So let me ask you a question. Here's the question I want to ask. Does your version of religion or politics get in the way of loving the people God loves? Hello, huh? Does your version of religion or politics get in the way of loving the people that God loves? See, what what, what happens is this. You can have your convictions, you can have your rules, you can have your traditions, and what happens is it can keep you from loving people, the ones who Jesus died for, and that's what was happening in this story. And so John continues, and here's what he says. But he replied, okay, this is the man who got healed, okay? The man who healed me told me to pick up your mat and walk. Wow. Wow. I'm going to listen to the guy who just healed me. I've been here for 38 years, and you guys have paid no attention to me. You haven't showed compassion. You haven't had a conversation with me. And now somebody comes and he shows compassion and he heals me. He makes me well. I'm going to listen to him. You see, listen to me. When what's best for people is no longer what's important to you, you're at odds with God. You're at odds with God. John would write these incredible words, for God so what? So loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. When what you do interferes with loving people who God created, you're at odds 
with God. That's why the scripture says that God opposes the proud because proud people are rule keepers. <laughs> you all right? They place the rules above people. And anything that you and I do that distance a person from God is wrong. It's sin. Anything that causes you and I to treat another person, okay, with a lack of dignity is wrong. It's sin. You know, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Wow. And if a man heals me of being paralyzed and he tells me to do something, like pick up your mat, I'm listening to him. I'm listening to him. You see, the religious system maybe has convinced you that you've done something wrong. And that's why you're in that condition. You know, God's punishing you. God doesn't love you. And I would say, you know what? Those are religious people. I want you to know that no matter where you find yourself, no matter how deep, how painful, how hurtful it is, I, no matter how many years you've been there, I want you to know that God's not mad at you, that God loves you. John continues this story. It's amazing. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. They're saying to this man who was healed, who told you that you could pick up your mat and walk on a Sabbath? Who is this man? Because he broke the law too. And he goes on, and here's what he says. The man didn't know for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Jesus just kind of moved on. But John goes on, he says, but afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, the man who he had healed, and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. I think Jesus might have been a little bit tongue-in-cheek there because everybody thought that he was sick, that he was paralyzed because of his sin. And Jesus was saying, no. And he was saying, basically, hey, don't listen to these religious leaders who have all of these rules. I'm clarifying something with you. I love you, and I'm asking you to love me. You see, l l listen to me. This is so, so, so important. When you recognize and receive Jesus, you will lose your fear of religion. Y'all okay? You'll experience grace. It won't be about performing. You will know that it's all about a relationship. It's all about following Jesus. It's all about learning him. And you will lose your fear of religious people. I have this happen to me all the time. I've had it happen to me for 35 years. Religious people will, will want to talk to me. They'll want to shoot me emails. They'll, they'll want to say this and they'll want to say that. And I said, you know what? You're adding to what God has already declared. You're confused. And maybe today, just maybe today, you're living with some guilt that has been passed down to you because of a religious system. Maybe through the home that you grew up in. Maybe the church that you grew up in. And today, Jesus wants to free you from that. Because when you follow Jesus, when you follow Jesus, religion will lose its grip on you. Look what John says. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him, which didn't set well with them. He goes on. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus or persecuting Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rule. John goes on and he says this. He says, but Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. Jesus is identifying himself with God, which made them even more angrier. Jesus is saying, hey, you want me to tell you something? God and I, we're always working seven days a week. We're never taking a day off. The Sabbath is for you. And so the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his father. Thereby, check this out, thereby by making himself equal with God. 
You know what they were saying? Who does he think he is? Exactly. And that is the question that all of us have to answer. Who does Jesus think he is? And here's what John would say to you and me. Follow the signs. Follow the signs. And it'll tell you who Jesus is. And so John wraps up and he says, so Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son cannot do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. You know what Jesus is telling them? Hey, you guys have never seen God. And if you want to know what God is like, then you want to know me. You want to see me. And God is a God of compassion. That's why I saw that man who was paralyzed for 38 years. That's why I had a conversation with him. That's why I asked him, do you want to be well? Because I am a God of compassion. If you want to know what God is, he's a God of compassion, not just sympathy. Sympathy is, I'm sorry. Compassion is, I can help you change your situation. And so John continues and he says, this of Jesus. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Basically means your sins are forgiven. You have a relationship with God the Father, and he wants to give you a quality of life, a zo life, one that is full, one that is abundant. He continues, they will never be condemned for their sins but they have already passed from death into life. Wow. And then he gives them the exclamation point. He says this. He says, you search the scriptures because you think they will give you eternal life. He's talking about the Old Testament that you and I know of. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me and receive this life. Wow. See, Jesus didn't fix, Jesus didn't fit into their box. He came to dismantle the dysfunction because the word that had come from heaven all the way down to earth had become confused, confusing. It lacked clarity. And Jesus came to dismantle the dysfunction of carelessness, of complacency, of callous religion. And he says, let me show you the true message. The true answer, it's faith in me. And when you have it, you experience eternal life. Would you pray with me? Maybe today you've been caught up in religion and you hope your good outweighs your bad. It never will. That's a mixed message. That's a confused message. You see, Jesus came to live a life that you and I could never live so that we could be forgiven and experience the life that he lived. And maybe your first step today is to say, Lord Jesus, I want to be well. Come and heal me of my hurts and my habits and my hangups and fill me with your power, your presence in my life. And if you have that desire, would you let us know? Because it's a relationship, it's not a religion. We would love to help you to take your next step. For others of us, truth of the matter, we're more religious in our politics and our our beliefs, okay? Keep us from really loving people the way that God would want us to love them. And so we hinder them. It might be a son. It might be a daughter. It might be a friend. It might be a coworker. And maybe you need to repent. And just say, God, I want to begin to love people as you love them, not through my lens of rules and regulations and tradition. Would you pray that? And so, Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to speak to us. We thank you for John who wrote down these events that he saw and that he heard and that he experienced so that we might believe and be forever transformed. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching today. 
hey, it's through your generosity and God's faithfulness that we're able to bless others. And so if you haven't partnered with us, we wanna encourage you to do that. And there's four easy ways that you can. You can give online, you can download our mobile app, you can text to give, or you can give at any of our physical locations across Northeast Ohio. And as always, we would love to see you there. Also be sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to keep up to date with everything that's happening at New Point. Thank you guys for watching. It's been another amazing week, and we'll see you guys next time.